Hey y'all, we're reading Twilight for the third time. Hey guys, what's up? My name is Dom. Welcome back to my channel. If you're new to my channel, I typically make bookish content, movie content, and anything else in between because I like to do whatever I want on this channel. What I meant by the introduction is that we're reading Twilight for the third time just in a different point of view. I've read the original Twilight, I've read the gender bent Twilight, and the whole playlist will be linked up above so you guys can go check that out. But today, we are reading Midnight Sun. It is Twilight, but in Edward's point of view. The long-awaited book. Also, before I go on, there is Native American representation in this book, but it is not good. The Quillalute tribe hates this. I'm gonna leave a link down below where you can donate to the Quillalute tribe because they need to move to higher ground. And without further ado, we're gonna get started. And yes, there will be spoilers, so heed heed my warning. But I'm already 66 pages in. We're, we're at the part where Bella and Edward are in the hospital after the near car accident. First of all, Edward is very, very moody. He is as moody as everyone said he was going to be. What happens in like two pages in the original book takes on for like five in this one. So in the beginning he was complaining about high school, which begs the question why like Carlisle and Esme just don't homeschool them. But I guess that would make them stand out more than they already do. I actually really liked the chapter where Bella first walked in and Edward smelled her for the first time and he had all these crazy thoughts because I thought that was a good way of showing us how vampires actually think because I said this in the Breaking Dawn vlog. I was kind of upset that Bella was a Mary Sue in the sense where she wasn't the average newborn. I wanted to see how vampires think and I think that first chapter was a good way of showing us that. At the end of the day, they are predators and they need to eat. Also, Edward's a prude. He gets so mad when these, you know, teenage boys, I know teenage boys can be gross with their fantasies, but you know, as long as they're not like sharing them nilly-willy, like what, what's the problem? We all got fantasies. Edward's kind of a prude because he always complains about the sexual fantasies some of these boys have, these 17 year old boys. And it's like, dude, you are 17. You cannot tell me as a human, you didn't have these type of thoughts. I, I refuse to believe it. I know you're from a different time, but I highly doubt a hundred years ago, or more than a hundred years ago by now, men were very, very proper. Okay. We get more insights about all the other vampire siblings. Rosalie is conceited. Um, she's more conceited than the original series made her out to be, I guess. Emma is hilarious. He doesn't take anything seriously. Jasper is struggling. And I know at one point when Edward's struggling, Jasper's kind of smug about it because he's no longer that sibling anymore. Alice is Alice. We still need more info on her, kind of, because she's kind of just there and not the Alice we know just yet. Jessica Stanley is kind of worse than I thought. Like, honestly, in the original series, I, she had her moments where she could be a little annoying, but I, like, I didn't mind her. I thought she was a good friend. But then you learn in Midnight Sun that that's not the case. Like, she's not being nice to Bella to be nice. She's just being nice to Bella to get more popularity because, you know, Bella was kind of popular by default. She's the new girl. And Jessica Stanley even says, now that I'm around Bella, people are looking at me. So she's more of a bitch than I thought she was. So another thing we d we get to see in this book, but not in Twilight, is that when Edward goes away, he, visit the, he visits the Denali Coven. That we knew, but we actually get to see the interaction between him and Tanya. And Edward points out that her Russian accent is disappearing. Like, it used to be there, and sometimes it'll come back, sometimes it won't. Because I had, I questioned this in one of my vlogs, like, how come we don't hear Carlisle's British accent? How come Alice doesn't have the southern drawl if she's from Mississippi? And I guess your accent disappears over time, which is kind of weird to me because vampires aren't supposed to change, so why are you losing your accent? I don't know. Again, thinking too deep into it. We also learned that the Denali Coven became vegetarians because they have an obsession with human men, and now their obsessions get to live. Edward's words, not mine. But which also begs the question I had in life and death though, like, because I mean, it's heavily, like Stephanie Meyer always dances around the word sex, we're aware of that. But it's heavily implied they get their sexual pleasure from, they get their sexual pleasure from human men, mostly, because the, the pool is bigger. Can you imagine putting your cold dick in a cold vampire vagina? I can't even imagine a cold dick going into my human vagina, like the roles being switched. How? I I have questions, but y'all do y'all do you. Y'all do you. We're not here to slut shame. Like, I don't even have a dick and that hurts just thinking about it. Edward is shocked by how smart Bella is, and he always refers to her as the girl and not by her name, which I thought was kind of interesting. Alice, you could we could already tell that Alice is in full support of him while everyone else is like, move on, who cares? Even Jasper's like, why are you tempting yourself? Just stay home. And then we get to the car accident scene and Alice actually saw a vision of it and that's why 
Edward jumped and he's like, not her, not her, you know. In Alice's vision, Bella did die, so Edward stopped it. And now they're just in the hospital and Edward's very worried about the girl and he doesn't know why he's worried if she's just a simple human. I feel like this book is going to give me a lot to say. Also, I just want to point out, I already found two typos. So Alice must be concentrating very hard. What? What's that? What's that? And then right here, it, there a problem with Mr. Banner, Edward. Who, who did this? So we're continuing with the Midnight Sun discussion from my uh, movie setup here. I'm 150 pages into that book. From where we left off, there was a chapter in the book where the Cullens came home from school and they had a discussion with Carlisle and Esme and this was after Edward saved Bella from the truck and they were discussing what to do. Rosalie and Jasper wanted to kill Bella and... We, we know how that turned out. It obviously didn't happen, but Edward was very dead set on not letting it happen. But Jasper really wanted to kill Bella. They thought silencing her would be easier. And it kind of sucks because, like, she was kind she was innocent. So why, and, I mean, I understand why they would have to kill her to keep her silent. But at the same time, I'm like, y'all are going to kill an innocent person when you should be, I don't know, destroying Edward or something. And I just, I just think it's funny thinking about how Bella doesn't know because I don't, they never discussed this in the original four books, but Bella doesn't know that at one point the Cullens were discussing whether or not to murder her. But Alice had two visions regarding Bella and Edward. One was that she was either going to become one of them or Edward was going to murder her. Like there was a vision where he was carrying her and she was bleeding. And Edward was like, I'm going to do everything I can to make both of those untrue. I'm going to leave. She's not going to be a vampire. I don't want to take her life away from her. There were a few scenes we got to see in Midnight Sun that you don't see in Twilight because obviously time is passing differently for the vampire versus human. But there was one scene where the humans, so like Bella, Jessica, Mike, and all of them were discussing like their dream locations. And Eric said Comic-Con and everyone started laughing, but Bella said Comic-Con as well. And then you find out that she didn't even know where Comic-Con was. She just she just said it because she didn't want uh, Eric to be ridiculed. She was saving him from that. So cute little scenes like that that, you know, Edward notices, but, but clearly Bella didn't care enough to remember because she didn't think they were significant enough. Because it puts more, it gives Bella more character because one thing I'm noticing is that she has more of a personality when you're reading about her through someone else's point of view. And listen, okay, so I thought my OCD was pretty bad. My, my OCD makes me think of worst case scenarios like, oh my god, what if my friend's house is going to burn on fire and burn to the ground? Edward must have it worse than I do. Not saying he has OCD, disclaimer, but just to give an example here, he must have it worse than I do because... The whole reason he started stalking Bella at night and watching her sleep was because he was minding his own business when he had the thought, oh my god, what if her house gets hit by a meteorite? A meteorite. A fucking meteorite. And he was like, someone has to be there to stop it. Like, fucking who? Who, bitch? Like, you're just gonna light on fire like the rest of us. No one's fucking stopping it. We're all fucking dying. Granted, he was like, oh, well, of course the meteorite is a hyperbole. But then I'm gonna think of all, the, all these other worst case scenarios that are never gonna happen. Like, at one point, he freaked out when he saw a spider and squished it right away. But he's like, oh, wait, these spiders can't hurt humans. And it's like, dude, she's not a fucking baby. Some, like, funny things is that when he thinks Bella thinks one thing, but, like, reading the original series, we know she's not thinking that. Like, like every time her heart speeds up or she blushes, Edward thinks she's scared of him. When in reality, we know she's, you know, falling for him. And it wasn't until he was talking to Miss Cole, Miss Co, whatever her name is, that he realized, hey, maybe Bella thinks I'm attractive. Like, he just put two and two together because he's a 17-year-old boy. That's all I gotta say about that. We did get to see the scene where he was making Bella's lullaby, or writing Bella's lullaby, composing Bella's lullaby. I'm struggling here. And I thought that was really cute to see how that how that came about and then we get to see the chapter where Edward goes hunting with Emmett and they talk about it and Ed it was basically Edward saying like wouldn't you do anything you can to protect Rosalie and during the hunting scene like Edward even says and Emmett knows this too which I think makes it sad but Edward says that Rosalie would give up anything if it meant she could become human again even Emmett and Emmett knows that and I think that's sad. It's, it's her, Their dynamic is really weird, and I don't like them as a couple either, to be honest. As much as this book is boring me to tears, every time Edward talks about uh, Jasper and Alice's relationship, I'm like that meme of the Spongebob fish where he's like uh, on his knees and, you know, pounding the ground. That, that's how I feel. And when he talks about Carlisle and Esme, fucking love them. 
Carlisle I fall in love with all the time. I fall in love with him more and more each time I like delve into this series. Rosalie and Emmett though I I don't get it. I love Emmett but I don't like Rosalie so I don't really get it. Um and then the chapter ends with him back in Bella's room watching her sleep because that's not creepy. So like final thoughts from what I read so far. Something I noticed about the narration style it's kind of like stream of consciousness not like not entirely but that's what it reminds me of. This is kind of boring me. It is dragging. It's hard reading from Edward's point of view. I don't know if it's because I've read Twilight and Life and Death so close before this or if it's because he's just that hard to read from. I have never read a character who had so much self self-loathing as much as Edward and not even just self self-loathing but it's so melodramatic and it, it is well written and maybe that's why he bothers me so much like it is very well written self self-loathing. He is honestly one of the worst point of views I've ever read from. For the longest time that place that that title was given to Holden Caulfield from The Catcher in the Rye but Edward wow holy fuck. So I'm 250 pages in. So like Bella and Edward were at the restaurant yada yada um it was it's like ugh, that's the other thing about this so I said life and death is like word for word the same as Twilight but this one's even worse like in life and death Stephanie Meyer was able to change some things because she says in her um, author's note that like life and death gave her the opportunity to change things that had always bothered her but for the sake of continuity I understand why she couldn't do that for Midnight Sun but it's still like not fun to read so Bella and Edward had their moment, had their time in the restaurant. And you know, I forgot where I said this. Maybe this was in another wrap-up or something. But I said somewhere that I would argue Twilight is not love at first sight, because that's what a lot of people say it is. And I would argue it's not, maybe like infatuation at first sight, but not love at first sight. Because Bella and Edward took time to form a relationship. I'm going to retract that statement, because Midnight Sun, Edward loved her from the get-go, like, without even a proper conversation. He's like, I absolutely love this girl. And I know a common topic of conversation is that Bella's love for Edward is a bit unhealthy, because it gets to the point where she's super codependent. And I would agree with that. I, I'd argue Edward's even worse. He's clingy to the point it's like, holy shit, you're kind of freaking me out. And like, there's some moments where he's giving me unrealistic expectations like damn I wish a guy would do that for me like the other day I wiped out because we had a blizzard recently and we're going through Chicago's going through a polar vortex right now the other day I wiped out on the ice walking my dog and no vampire boyfriend came to save me right right and then there's some lines that are kind of romantic and then there's just other shit that Edward does where I'm like let it go but um they had their dinner scene I'm gonna I'm gonna say it I'm gonna say it it was cuter in life and death I said it. Yeah, I fucking said it. Here's the thing what you learn in Midnight Sun. Edward genuinely thinks he's doing good by wanting to run away from Bella because he genuinely thinks in order to be a good person he wouldn't be anywhere near her because he's so, so afraid of hurting her. I mean, part of me is like, okay, Edward, loosen up a little, but the other part of me kind of respects that. Like, if you're that scared of hurting someone, I could see you over... not overreacting, but I could see you see that person be expressive for lack of a better term I don't know what I'm fucking saying I guess so I guess part of it is interesting getting Edward's point of view because in summary what I'm trying to say is he's not actually mad at Bella he's mad at himself as per usual we were at the scene where Jessica questioned Bella about how the date night went cuz you know Jessica has these impure thoughts about it but she's replacing Bella with herself and she's kind of a bitch and like it's very obvious the way this is written Stephanie Meyer doesn't want you to like Jessica I like Jessica she is I the way she's perceived him and they said yeah she's kind of a bitch but her thoughts are hilarious Edward is low-key horny too we always make fun of Bella for being so horny in this series because she is but Edward's horny too the amount of times he like he admits to wanting to touch her and that's all it says like he just wants to touch her it doesn't really specify but the way it's worded like you could tell he's having these impure fantasies about sex and all that so it's like dude you're fucking horny in the original series Bella hardly ever mentioned her looks and it's because she just thought she was so ordinary but in this one Edward actually describes her clothes that infamous blue blouse is mentioned she wears the blue blouse at dinner and then the next morning he mentions how her hair is in this messy bun and she's wearing this ugly green sweater and he is so fucking horny for that blue blouse because he's like I wish he would wear it again so now we know why he creams his pants when she wears the blue blouse and a khaki skirt 
he really likes Angela and I think his thoughts on Angela are really cute because he he appreciates how nice she is to Bella and he really wants to reciprocate that he like he wants to give her something but Angela is just so selfless it's hard for him to figure it out he mentions having gym class with Alice which shocked me because I was under the impression like Carlisle would write them a note to get him out of it so I was kind of shocked that they have to do gym just the way Rosalie's talked about in this book I, I said earlier too that I I don't like Rosalie at all in this book and it makes me wonder how does Edward stand her how does anyone stand her because every no one like minus Emmett nobody talked about Rosalie in a good light in this book so far how, why why do they keep her around the way like at least the way she's described here and this is another case of Stephanie Meyer very obviously wanting you to hate a certain character. So I don't know if I'm going to get to any reading tonight. I have to go up, I have to go um, edit a video, my movie, I'm start picking up the movie reactions again. So I have to go finish editing that. I'm doing that while binging a show. I'm currently watching Turn Washington Spies, which is about the spies of the Revolutionary War. And you know, I know it's my duty as an American to root for the Patriots, but this show has a way of making me question how the fuck we won the Revolutionary War because all these fucking characters are incompetent. If the villain is supposed to be bad, why is he the only competent character of this whole goddamn show? Okay, so I'm like 300 pages into this book. Let me get my notes out. I have some things to say. Some things I forgot to mention is that, yes, I did notice that Charlie and Bella have similar minds. Like, Edward could still read Charlie's, but Charlie's is more like a mumble. And I think that's really cool. So I wonder what Charlie's uh, gift would have been if he was a vampire. And I did notice the Hades and Persephone, like, similes, metaphors, whatever, figurative language. And suddenly the ugly ass cover of this book makes sense. That pomegranate still freaks me out. Because Angela is so nice, Edward wants to repay her with a gift, but she doesn't want anything material. She wants this boy. And Edward, his gift to her is getting the boy to ask her out. And it's, you know, Ben Cheney. So him and Emmett have a little cute moment. And then, because they sit right in front of Ben in Spanish. So Emmett was asking Edward, like, hey, why didn't you ask out Angela? You know, Edward made his excuses. Ben is, like, fuming because he doesn't want Edward to ask out the girl he likes. And it gets Ben to ask out Angela. So that's how that happened, which I think is really cute. We love, we love to see it. Also, can I just say I'm glad we see more of Emmett in these books because I swear to God in the original series he has like two lines per book. So I'm glad Stephanie Meyer like made him shine in this one because it's what Emmett deserves. Edward's asking Bella questions, right? And we find out because there's that CD Bella's constantly listening to. And we find out that it's Hybrid Theory by Linkin Park. And y'all know what I have? I have Hybrid Theory by Linkin Park. I've owned this since high school. Every song in this album is an absolute fucking banger. My favorite song's Crawling. It has been stuck in my head ever since reading that chapter. And, I, and I've been listening to this album on repeat lately, and I cannot believe in the year of our Lord 2021, I am listening to Hybrid Theory by Linkin Park on repeat because of a Twilight book. But I really enjoyed this chapter because we got to find out more about Bella because in Be like Bella in the original Twilight just glances over it. Like she doesn't, we don't see her answers in that and it's just to show us that Bella doesn't really think highly of herself. Like she doesn't have great self-esteem. Edward loves everything about her, even the minute details. He even asked her like what her favorite soda is. He said Coke or Pepsi, she said Dr. Pepper and I felt that. We have a lot different tastes in books. Like me and Bella would fight if we had a book discussion. I'm not gonna read just yet because I have a poster to hang up. I got a new tapestry for uh, Christmas and I have not hung it up yet and it is currently February 7th. And then I'm going to finish Tokyo Ghoul because I have five chapters left of volume five. And then we're going to do fuck knows what else. There's tapestry and it looks so good. I love it. It's 1130 at night. I was going to go to bed but then I realized I have 150 pages left of Midnight Sun. Actually 130. So I was like wow. I should probably update y'all before it's too late and then I'm kicking myself in the ass for waiting so long to update. So I'm going to skip things here and there and really talk about things we see in Midnight Sun but not in Twilight. For example, in Edward's memories, we see him have Christmas with Carlisle. Like this is around the time Edward's still a newborn. Like I want to say just a little after a year he was bitten and Christmas with Carlisle sounds so cute because Carlisle felt so bad for taking his human life away. So he still wanted to give Edward some semblance of that. And we stand Carlisle in this house. I want to marry that man so fucking bad. But he fell in love with someone like Esme. I am nothing like Esme. So Carlisle would probably turn the other cheek. Either that 
or he just adopt me as his daughter, which would be weird because we are the same age. I, I can't, I can't believe that man's 23. 23 with five moody teenagers as children. I'm 23, can't even take care of myself. I, I don't get it. I don't get it. Another thing we see in Midnight Sun, but not in Twilight, is again a flashback where during this time, Edward meets Siobhan and Maggie, who are part of the Irish Coven. And Siobhan makes a comment about how Carlisle took away the greatest gift from Edward, which is the the taste of human blood. You eventually find out that comment is what triggered him to go exploring for human blood eventually. So they're about to go hiking to the meadow and it's just really funny because uh, Edward's so self-conscious and he, he thinks, so Bella's really nervous. We know why Bella's nervous, right? She's, she's just nervous to hike purely because she's clumsy, can't walk to save her life and that's it. That's the only fear she has. But Edward like genuinely thinks she's scared and going like she's scared of him and is gonna be scared to see his skin and that's he's like freaking out about that. And during this walk there's actually a conversation between Edward and Bella we get to see. First of all, so I just want to add this chapter, this metal chapter was way too long. It was a lot longer than it needed to be and it was killing me. I hate long chapters. We actually get to learn more about Renee. So in the original Twilight series, I don't think I mentioned this mentioned this in those vlogs, but in the original Twilight series it was kind of, sort of, made clear that Renee wasn't the best parent, but Bella still loved her. But because it was told in Bella's point of view, we didn't really get to see Renee for who she is because Bella has, you know, high regard for her mom. But with Edward's point of view, we find out that Renee was essentially a deadbeat. Like, Renee straight up thought that Bella was holding her back. Like, Renee always wanted to go on these adventures. But she couldn't because she had a child. I mean, the whole reason Bella felt like she had to move two forks was because she didn't want to hold her mom back from her husband, Phil. Bella has all these stories where she had to be the adult. She had to step up and take and take care of her own mother. She made Bella feel like a burden, essentially. And that's why Bella always wants to put other people's needs before hers. Edward's very shocked about this. And a lot of things are finally clicking for him. He has a very strong dista distaste for it, Renee. It wasn't like explicitly said. But I got the hint. I think Bella needs to grow a fucking backbone, personally. Like, I know punching your mom is disrespectful. I am well aware. It's Renee is Bella's mom, so I'm aware that Bella cannot punch her own mother. However, Renee is not my mother, so if I ever saw Renee, it's on sight. I will fucking deck her. Like, how dare you make your child feel like that? I don't know. Like, I... And, like, I, the reason I say Bella needs to grow a backbone is because of how devoted she is to her mom. Like, she loves her... Like, her mom treated her like that, and yet she loves her unconditionally. Like, mmm. Like, I get... Like, I get it. That That's her mom. That was her kind of, sort of, caretake, caretaker over the years. I get it. Like, you don't want to talk ill of your mom like that, but Bella. Bella. That's part of Bella's character, finding the good in everyone, but Bella... Bella, honey, it is okay to talk shit once in a while, especially the way your mom treated you. Um, so and they're in the car ride home when we actually get a tidbit about Rosalie saving Emmett. What was this? He didn't tell Bella this. This was another flashback. Rosalie was just minding home business while hunting, saw Emmett get attacked by a bear and just took him and ran and went to go save him. As the venom was going through his body, her and Edward had a moment by the lake and that's when they like truly became brother and sister who trusted each other. And I thought that tidbit was really cute because, again, the way Rosalie is written, I feel like Stephanie Meyer, like, wants us to dislike her. And I am going to admit, for me, it kind of works, but I still like seeing that chapter. There was a tidbit about Alice's past, like, we already know that she doesn't remember anything from her human years. But Edward talked about how he has seen her first memory of waking up. She woke up in like the middle of nowhere. She saw a vision of someone saying her name. She saw she saw visions of Jasper and the Cullens. So if she essentially if she couldn't see the future, she would have gone savage. So blah blah blah. Edward admits that he was, you know, going to her room at night. Bella freaked out because she was more concerned about the fact that she talks in her sleep than the fact that a 17-year-old boy vampire or whatever sneaks into her room at night to watch her sleep where are your priorities girl but even edward was questioning that he's like why are you more concerned about what you said in your sleep than the fact that i am watching you sleep like even edward is questioning it so bella bella come on you need get a fucking backbone and get your priorities straight girl main series everyone was like why don't you just bite her like who cares 
why do you want her to stay human so bad? Like, what's going to happen when she's 50 years old and you're still 17? So in this conversation, you find out that Edward is actually worried because she's human. Humans have very fickle minds. We date. We get over people. So we find out that Edward is actually worried that that's going to be Bella's circumstance. Like, right now she loves Edward because she's a naive 17-year-old girl. He's worried the older she gets, the more she's gonna real the more she's gonna grow up and mature and move on from him. His fear is actually valid. So Midnight Sun makes it very clear that your your mentality when you when you're bit and become a vampire, your mentality stops at the age you're a bit. So that's Edward's worried. Because she's not a vampire, she's not gonna forever be mentally 17, and he's just worried that she's going to move on from him and find another human man. Bella meets the Collins, nothing new here. Carlisle's chapter where you find out his background, nothing new there, and I actually appreciate what Stephanie Meyer did because she did not rehash everything we already know. But we also find out more flashbacks of Edward's time of drinking human blood. We all know that Edward has a mental anguish thing about this because he was choosing to kill murderers and rapists and other bad people, right? And I think, this wasn't said explicitly, but I think it's because he was playing God and he feels guilty about that, like he was deciding who can live and not. Even if they were bad people, he was still making that, like a choice he felt like he should not have been the one making. And I didn't say this like earlier in the vlog, but it was something that was in the back of my mind. I understand the concept of playing God, you know, growing up Roman Catholic, so this this thing is not is not new to me. But while reading this, as someone who is really no longer religious, I, I didn't I don't mind that Edward was playing God, personally. There's one specific flashback that he has in mind. Edward stopped this man from committing pedophilia, and it was, that was not said explicitly, it was just highly inferred the way Stephanie Meyer wrote about it. I'm cheering on Edward, obviously, right? And it's just, it's just what got me was that Edward still felt guilty about this specific incident. And I, but I can't help but cheer him on because Edward, you stopped a pedophile from hurting, from not just hurting, from raping a child. So I can't help but feel glad that you did that. I congratulate you for playing God in that instance. There's just like certain things that Stephanie Meyer writes in these things I just, I can't really agree with. And it's just probably the fact that different, the different religious upbringings, because you know, Catholicism, Mormon, Mormonism, two different religions. And just the fact that she is religious, I guess, and I am not. The whole playing God thing I know is like so controversial, but it's like, dude, Edward, stop feeling guilty. You literally stopped a man from raping a child. There was nothing to feel guilty about that. But then we get to the baseball scene. The baseball scene was actually a lot cooler in this book than in the first book because we're actually reading it from a vampire's point of view. And also, Edward's from Chicago. I asked this in the first vlog. Is he a Cubs or a White Sox fan? I need to know. Honestly, I think he's a Cubs fan just because, like, he's too bougie. He... <sighs> I do not get Chicago vibes from Edward in the slightest, but knowing Edward, he'd, he'd probably have some... Because So a lot of people outside of City Limits tend to be Cubs fans simply because of the location of Wrigley Field. People always got a lot of shit to say about where the White Sox play, which is very unfortunate because I've been to that stadium twice now and I like love that stadium. I think it's a really cool stadium. It's just the neighborhood. A lot of people not from the city are um, weary of it. But whatever. But I feel like Edward would be one of those people, so that's why I think he would be a Cubs fan. But because I worked so hard on that little clip that I put in the Twilight vlog, I'm going to insert it in this one, so enjoy. <laughs> Blah, 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 uh, Laurent, Victoria, and James come. And it was actually interesting because Victoria was actually anxious and wanting to run away during that whole scene, which I did not get from the original Twilight, so that was cool to see. And I remember in the first book, I was wondering, how did they not hear uh, Bella's heartbeat? So that got cleared up. Uh, Edward was tapping his foot along to the beat so that they, the sounds would mix together and people would get confused. But also Jasper, his power, not only does he manipulate your emotions, but he can kind of like project. He had like the shield around him, Alice, Esme, and Bella. And I think Edward as well. So that if James looked at them, he would get bored and think it was tedious and look away. So he didn't like, because of what Jasper... This is really hard to describe, but it was, it, Stephanie Meyer does it better. 
but because whenever he looked at that direction, he didn't see anything of importance, so he just looked away, and that's why he didn't notice Bella right away. But so when Jasper's shield dropped, James saw Alice, and there was so much potential that Meyer could have done with that scene, but it was just a paragraph long. All Edward says about it is that Jasper was surprised to see Alice, but then he couldn't figure out why, so he just brushed it off as, you know, him noticing Alice for the first time, like, oh, new vampire. And I just feel like, given Alice's past, the fact that she was in a fucking mental asylum, Stephanie Meyer could have fleshed that out so much more. But then they just have the same fucking argument in the car. One difference I did notice is that whenever Emmett complimented Bella, so Emmett really likes Bella, and I thought that was really cute. But whenever he complimented Bella in the original book, Bella was slightly insulted by the way he said it because she thought he was saying it in a way where, you know, he thought Bella was stupid, so was surprised that she is indeed smart. Whereas Edward does not mention that at all. Which leads me to believe that Bella's perception of how Emmett looked at her was wrong. I have no nothing else to say. That took me a lot longer to get out than I wanted it to, so I'm gonna go to bed. Okay, so I've read about 50 more pages. We saw Bella say goodbye to her dad. Emmett and Alice were hiding, which is a detail we don't get to see in the first book, and I thought that was really cool. But oh my god, Charlie. That is so sad. So what we don't see in the book is Charlie's like true reaction to when Bella finally leaves, but because Edward can read minds, we do see it. And it's really sad because he talks about how Charlie like stayed out on the porch for a while and then when he did go back in he just stared at a blank TV and I think that's so sad. They did my boy Ch Bella, I mean she had to, she had to do it for his protection, but Bella did my boy Charlie dirty. She did the best YA dad dirty. But, like, I can't say she did him dirty, because, like, it was to keep him safe, and plus she does feel bad, but still, oh, Charlie, I felt so bad for him. But then we also got to see Edward's, uh, little scruffle with James, which is what we don't see in the first book, so he's with Carlisle and Emmett. And what I like about this chapter is that the three of them would firmly decide things, and then Alice would text them responses to that, so I thought that was really cool, because in the first book we don't see that Alice is still in coordination with them. I can hear like the Chicago nasal in my accent right now while talking. Usually I can't hear how nasally my voice is until it's played back to me, but oh my god, I can hear it right now, and it's really bothering me. When the, like, when the Chicago comes out of my accent, I'm so sorry. I deeply apologize for it. But anyway, besides like the texting, um, this chapter was really underwhelming. Because honestly, the moment James noticed it was a trap, he was constantly one step ahead of everyone. And it just, the stakes weren't high. May like, maybe theoretically they were, and Stephanie Meyer just couldn't write it well. But I, I was expecting more, and then we did it, we did it get it and that's really disappointing. I wanted more Emmett as well because I feel like this would be Emmett's time like Emmett would truly be in his element right now and just because in the original series we don't get a lot of Emmett. They realize uh James went back so they go back to Forks thinking he's there and it was like two in the morning when Alice called like oh my god he changed decisions I'm scared and Edward's like do these things and here we are now Edward's on his way back not his way back but now Edward's on his way to Phoenix okay I'm already taking a break from reading because dinner is ready but I just read the chapter just called race where they're racing their way towards Bella and I thought it was really cool they were really in this like really ugly car but it was the fastest they had and I just I thought it was cool seeing Edward's panic the obstacles they had to go through to get there while Alice was seeing these really scary visions and I like I have nothing else to say other than that really and just Jasper's powers coming into play how although Alice like Alice was panicking whenever she saw a vision and Edward was obviously panicking but Jasper used his powers to make everyone focus so I thought that was really cool because like in the original series Stephanie Meyer says he can manipulate motions but we didn't really see it a lot but we truly do see it in Midnight Sun how the manipulation works and I'm glad she added that. There was like a few moments of the action where my eyes kind of just like glided through because I didn't care so I'm not gonna say that this was a well-written chapter by any means but right now they made it to the studio they were very silent with the car also they like forced a woman to like give up her car because they were they were about to fake an accident and then Carlisle went, went to this woman while she was angry went to this woman stabbed a needle in her that knocked her out and left her at the side of the road and then Emmett caused a car accident by pushing the original vehicle into it into the street and like y'all are savage Everyone, it is a good day because I finally, finally finished this book. It has been a month in the making and it's done. 
Let's take a thumbnail because I keep forgetting to do that. I have a lot to talk about and let's get started. I should mention this before actually because you know how in the first book there's that plot hole of Alice getting the call from James. Like she thought it was from Renee but it was actually James and then we're all like how come Alice didn't hear that? How come she didn't see it in her vision? So that plot hole was um I don't want to, I'm hesitant to say fix, but Stephanie Meyer didn't mention it, and it, like, yeah, Alice saw the vision, she just got the timing wrong, and that's why she wasn't able to stop Bella in time. When they're actually there to save Bella, it's, it is more dramatic than Twilight, but still not as dramatic as the movie. The movie had a way, like, from what I can remember, the movie had a way of making it so, so melodramatic, and like, yeah, Edward was still having this, like, painful inner monologue during the whole thing, but it wasn't like, I shouldn't say it wasn't exactly like the movie, but it wasn't like he was as confused as he was in the movie. In the book, he kind of, he does know what he wants and like, yeah, he mulls over it, but then he like just does it. Good for him. We stand. There's a whole chapter about chores, so it was basically what Alice had to do in order to create this whole story. And it's just like the mental image, because in order to crack the window, or not crack it, but shatter the window, Alice curled into a bowling ball position and threw herself down the stairs. And just that mental, that just that mental image was hilarious. And there's also a little moment where Emmett's like looking at Bella and saying she's a cute, or not cute, but she's a good kid. Uh, Rosalie needs to come around. And multiple times throughout this, I don't know if I mentioned it, but like since the moment James was introduced, like multiple times since then, Edward notices that Emmett, he tones down the humor that he usually relies on, he tones it down, and all his thoughts are on protecting Bella, and it's just this, it's just this big brother energy, and it, it, like, Emmett's the big brother I've always wanted, and it's just so cute to me, it's so precious, and I love it. Emmett deserves more time in these books. I, I don't know why we're reading more about Edward and Bella when Emmett's right there, Rosalie's- I'm not even a Rosalie fan and I'd rather read about Rosalie. Alice is right there, Jasper's right there. Come on. But something that hit me when reading this little section was that you know how Rosalie was on the verge of death so Carlisle saved her but she was still pissed off about that because she's like, you took my humanity away from me. It hit me while reading Emmett's like big brother moments that kind of, that's like what Rosalie did to him. He was on the verge of death, so she had Carlisle bite him to save him, because why not? Like, she wasn't in love with him yet. Don't you think that's a bit hypocritical? Because, like, she... I, mm, like, she's so angry at what Carlisle did to her, just to do the same thing to Emmett. So I was like, girl, what... I, mm, I, is it different because you love him? Is it different because he doesn't mind being a vampire? I don't know, but it hit me while reading this book in that specific section. Not even the section where it happened. I don't know why I waited until now to for it to click. But then we meet Renee again, and her thoughts are loud. Like, she as a person might be a little quiet when she speaks, but Edward noticed that her thoughts are so loud, it's like someone's actually verb verbally talking. He kind of equated it to Jasper's power or Jasper's gift where he can manipulate our emotions but like using like our actual nerves. Whereas if Renee was a vampire, she would kind of have the same thing but it would be all with her mind. Like I want Charlie and Renee to be vampires and see how that would work out. Okay, so I'm really pissed that Stephanie Meyer did not expand anything on Alice. Edward mentioned that it's a subject they were avoiding until both of them were ready. But it was like, here was your chance to add more of Alice's life into these books, and you didn't fucking do it. Like, the whole fandom, I shouldn't say the whole fandom, but so many people in this fandom, in this franchise, want to see more than just Edward and Bella. And, like, this was her chance to bring in more for Alice, because all of Alice's life, if it's not, like, other than what we learn in New Moon, everything else is in the Twilight Illustrated Guide, which a lot of people don't even know exists. So it's like, why didn't you take the opportunity to put it in here? Like, I want to know what Alice thinks about it. Edward can read her mind. Why does he not know what she thinks about it? I, I want to know. After the video, Edward did have, like, a moment. So he, a lot of... I, I know I was making fun of his, like, mental anguish throughout this video, but the mental anguish during, you know, saving Bella and then watching that video was actually really sad, and I did feel bad for him. Like, there's nothing to snark about it, what he was feeling. It was a cool moment to see when he finally broke down and was praying to what he thought was Bella's god. Because, like, part of Edward's belief system is that he has no soul, there is no god for him. So he, here's this boy so beaten down that he's finally praying to something he doesn't even know he believes in. And 
I feel like that's a gut-wrenching thing, and as someone who grew up with religion, like, I've been there. So I feel that, and I thought that was a cool tidbit to add, so we really saw how much Edward was truly suffering. And we get to the prom scene, and I just, to this day, I just can't believe Bella's head is so empty that she didn't, re she didn't realize Edward was bringing her to prom and just assume Edward changed his mind about biting her and was going to do it right then and there in a fancy dress. Girl, head empty, no thoughts. Head empty, just thoughts of vampire dick. Let's be serious. There's some inter interesting foreshadowing, though, so we don't see this in the original book because obviously Bella can't read minds, but when Jacob went to go see Bella, he mentions that Bella smells bad, and then Edward talks, Edward, like, mentions to, to us that she's not wearing any perfume, and I thought that was, like, a cool foreshadowing moment to what's gonna happen in New Moon, and speaking of foreshadowing in New Moon, there was actually a lot of that because one of Alice's visions was Edward going away and seeing Bella just in this mental torment, and that's what happens in New Moon, so Alice saw that coming, good for you, Alice, I don't know why Edward bet against you, which is what Bella even said. She's like, I'm not bet betting against Alice. And then Jacob leaves, and then they go to outside, and you know, that's where Bella was like, oh, I thought you were gonna bite me. That's why we're dressed up. Fucking dumbass. Head empty, no thoughts. And it just, it just ends with Edward kissing her neck. And I was like, oh, that's kind of a bittersweet moment, especially because the way it ended. So also, what I thought was really wholesome and something I can't make fun of, the reason Edward dragged Bella to prom was because he had this, his own vision of, you know, Bella as a grown woman with a husband that's not him and children and one day her children ask, ask her what was prom like and he wanted to be able to like give her an answer to that that wasn't just, oh I didn't go because I'm boring. And I, I thought that was really sweet and he was mentioning like I don't even want to think about who the husband is but as long as he makes her happy, I'm happy. And I... That, that, like, tugged at my heartstrings a little. And how this book ended, because Edward talks about, I know in the future she's gonna, she's, you know, gonna grow old and have to leave me. I'll see the sign, like, I'll recognize the sign right away, but right now I just want to live in the present. I just want to use up every moment I have with her. And, like, just the way it was written, like, his, like, fear of that, but also the acceptance... It, it tugged at my heartstrings a little, and then when it ended, I was a little somber, and I was like, alright, Edward, got me feeling bad for you. But then the book ended, and I'm really glad, because, wow, his mental anguish was very hard to get through. Usually I live, live for a character's mental anguish, but this one I just had a hard time. I think I'm gonna give this book, honestly, like, two out of five stars, because it was a struggle to get through sometimes, and, like, Honestly, the only parts I truly, truly enjoyed, like really enjoyed, were the parts we did not see in the original book, but there was just so, so few of them. I only have one question because every thought I had about this book, like I mentioned throughout the video, but one thing is, like you know there's that phenomenon when a man writes a woman character or just female character and we can tell a man wrote it, surely there has to be something on the opposite side of the spectrum. Surely there have to be male characters written by women, and men can tell it's written by a woman. I just want to know if people read this book and, like, know Edward Cullen was written by a woman. Like, is my, does my question make sense? I'm so curious about that, because there's a few times where, like, I was wondering, because, like, I'm not male. I identify as a woman. So, like, I don't, I don't know what the male mind is like, but I'm so curious. Like, any guys out there, have you read this? Is, is it, like, obvious Edward's written by a woman? Let me know down below. I'm, so, I'm really curious. Another thing I want to quickly add, though. So, like, yeah, there's parts of Edward's mental anguish where I just can't make fun of them because they aren't, they aren't snarkable. I can't snark on it because I genuinely felt bad. But for the majority of this book, my conclusion is that I will personally pay for Edward Cullen's therapy appointments because, God damn it, dude some fucking therapy holy, holy crap and I am saying this as if, as if he's real but please for the love of God <laughs> but that's all I have to say about this book but now that I finished this book I could take a big sigh of relief I could finally react to the movies on this channel and I am gonna go ahead and go finish season two of Attack on Titan because y'all what the fuck is happening in this show? Like, I mean that in the best way possible because things are fucking happening. But that's it for this video. If you made it this far, thank you so much for watching. All of my social media links will be down below. There's Twitter, there's Goodreads, there's Instagram, there's there's more and I don't remember. If you like this video, give it a big thumbs up, comment, subscribe, y'all know the drill. And without further ado, I'm gonna peace out and I will see you guys later. Ciao, 2D.